Huntsville, Alabama. I'm coming from Junaluska, North Carolina, because today I left my home to go on a hunting trip uh, to North Carolina. I'm on my way from near Duke, where my daughter will be going to school this fall to find a place for her to live. And there was a lot of traffic. I didn't make it to my hotel. So I stood at a random hotel and asked to use their conference room. And here we are. <laughs> um, let me tell you about solar cooling. Solar sails are, uh, let me just quickly a little bit, that when you're, when you're in space, you tend to think of it as being big and empty. And it mostly is. Space is a vacuum, and uh, it's not a perfect vacuum. There is stuff out there, but it's far from empty. Um, in fact, when you look at it in, in a different way, not only it's filled with light from the sun, which uh, streams out the solar system, and we use it. Uh, it brings life to Earth and drives photosynthesis, drives our climate. Uh, we're very dependent on the sun for uh, gravity that keeps the Earth circling it. Um, also has streams of charged particles coming out from it. Uh, interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. A lot happening. It's far, far, far from empty. And when you think about all the energy that's out there, um, we, you can figure out how to use it. And we've been using it in space for quite a while and use it on the ground now in photo array, solar panels, solar cells, to generate a little bit of electricity. But it turns out that you can also use light for propulsion. Just as sailing ships uh, can use the momentum of the wind to propel themselves across the water, uh, put up the sail, the wind hits the sail, reflects from it, it gives some of its energy momentum to the sail and pushes it. And because the sail is attached to a spacecraft, the spacecraft or the ship, the ship is pulled with it. Well, so will a solar sail move in space. If you take a, a large lightweight reflector and you have a, it's a very thin lightweight film, thick uh, saran wrap coated with aluminum to make it reflective of visible light. And you put it out in space, light reflect from it. And as light reflects from it, it pushes it just like the wind pushes on a sail. That's why it's called a solar sail. Now, don't be confused this with the solar wind. The solar wind, the stream of charged particles coming from the sun, and they don't propel a solar sail. It's sun that does. And in particular, it's the little particles of light called photons, which reflect from the sail like little BBs, and they push on it. I have here a piece of solar sail. This is actually the same material that will be flying in space. The thickness, for those of you that aren't follic challenged like me, uh, is the thickness of a human hair. It's made of a plastic like saran wrap, not the same, and it's coated. And as light reflects from it, it's push it. And it's a very small push, but over time, it can give you quite a bit of velocity. A solar sail, contrary to intuition can be used to sail toward the sun as well as away from the sun. Now, this gets kind of mathematically mathematical pretty quickly, but think of it this way. Everything uh, that we launch from the Earth is orbiting the sun, which means it's moving. It's got some velocity as it goes around the sun. So when we launch a spacecraft from the Earth, the rocket gives it some extra speed, but the Earth also does because it's launching from the Earth. So it's already got a direction that it's going. So if you deploy the sail and tilt the angle of the sail to get the light to reflect in the direction you want, you can change the direction of the, the light thrust, the net thrust from the sail pushing on it. So if, if you're the sun and I deploy the sail like this, it would move away, except I'm moving. I'm moving like this around you. So the sail, if you put it like this and tilt it so it gets a, a push going in the direction it's already moving, well, it accelerates. And that means it'll spiral away from the sun. If you turn it like this, it gets a push opposite the direction I'm moving, and it slows down and starts spiraling in toward the sun. So a solar sail is actually pretty useful, not just to go away from the sun, but to go toward the sun. And that's why they're revolutionary. Now I mentioned that the force is very small. It's extremely small. Uh, many of you probably have seen football games, go to, go to football games, 
uh, Watchman TV, whatever. Uh, if you take two football fields, two football fields on a sunny day at noon when the sun is directly overhead and all the light reflecting from that football field is pushing on that football field a little bit. And the force is the same as the force you would experience if you were to put a quarter and a penny in your hand. It's very little bit. You can feel it, but it's not much. The advantage of this, though, is that it's constant. It's a constant acceleration as long as the sun is shining, which means you'll keep going faster and faster and faster as long as the sun's out. And it better be out or we're all in trouble, right? Whereas with a conventional rocket, you can only go as fast as the fuel you carry will allow you to go before you run out of gas and you coast. That's the beauty of a solar sail. There have been several solar sail missions flown. Uh, NASA flew its first sail uh, from NASA Marshall, where I work. I was uh, uh, managing the office where this project happened. It's called Nano Sail D, uh, made out of the same material, deployed by four booms, and it was a total surface, a total area of about 100 square feet, pretty small. Okay. Uh, the Japanese flew a sail. Uh, called Icaros, that was really big. It was about 2,000 square feet. That flew in 2010, and it flew in interplanetary space. Last few years in Earth orbit, the light sail uh, missions from the Planetary Society, a private space group, have flown. The Canadians have flown one, the Europeans. But over the next two to five years, there will be some significant missions. These are the ones I'll be talking about. The Near-Earth Asteroid Scout, which I am uh, have the privilege of serving as the technology lead or the principal investigator, and the Solar Cruiser, for which I also serve as the PI. Uh, now, Near-Earth Asteroid Scout is a big sail. It's about 925 square feet of this material. It will be our first interplanetary mission using solar sail propulsion. The Japanese flew one in 2010, but it was really just a test and demo. It didn't go anywhere and do any science. We're different. We are going to be taking a small spacecraft that's about the size of a microwave oven, has a camera on it, and we'll be taking it to an asteroid. And the speed that the sail will add to the craft after it launches from the rocket is on the order of about three extra miles per second. Three miles per second. You're used to driving 60 miles per hour. That's pretty slow. Uh, you know, that's a mile a minute. We're going to go three miles extra per second just using reflected sunlight. The purpose is to characterize the asteroid and do it for low cost because sails are relatively inexpensive to build and fly. NIA Scout, Near Earth Asteroid Scout, is one of 13 small payloads that will fly this fall on the first launch of NASA's Space Launch System on the Artemis 1 mission. Uh, most of those missions, small spacecraft, are going to the moon. Some are going to study other uh, physics and science in the solar system, but we're the only one that's going to an asteroid, and that will be uh, uh, our target. It'll take about two and a half years to reach the asteroid that we will be uh, visiting. Here's a size comparison, so you can get a sense of how big the sail material is once the sail is deployed in space. If you look at this picture on the bottom right, there's a little box that says spacecraft. That's how big our spacecraft is. The whole thing that's got the sail, the computer, the camera, everything. Um, it's about that size. You can see a shadow of a, of a person standing at the back of the school bus. That would be me. And then you see the deployed sail. You'll notice it looks like a big X. What you see down in the, in the middle of the white where the X is, is you're seeing the booms that are coiled up and slowly are played out with a motor. And those booms are each 21 feet long, and they unfurl the sail. Here is a picture of the Near Earth Asteroid Scout flight sail as it was being tested. You can see the 24 foot booms on the left and the fully deployed spacecraft in the, on the right side. And uh, there's an arrow pointing to the middle where the, uh, the little uh, spool was that the sail was curled up on. Now, I will tell you next about the Solar Cruiser mission. Solar Cruiser is a much larger sail. It will launch in 2025. 
uh, with another mission called the uh, IMAP mission, which is has nothing to do with solar sailing, but it's paying for the rocket. We're a smaller payload. We're along for the ride. Uh, the spacecraft for the near Earth asteroid Scout is about 24 pounds. The spacecraft for Solar Cruiser is about 200 pounds, and it has a lot more capability than the uh, near Earth asteroid Scout sail. And that's because it will deploy a sail that is much, much larger than the Nia Scout. It's a, um, it's a sail that's about 17,000 square feet. Um, I don't know many people who have homes are 17,000 square feet. I, it, the closest comparison I can give you would be an Olympic swimming pool, or the next time you go to Home Depot uh, or Lowe's, it would be roughly the floor area of a big, big part of their store. So Solar Cruiser, what is it going to do? It will fly toward the sun and it will, this, as the sail is deployed, it will go closer to the sun than something called the Lagrange point. Again, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but uh, I will explain it such that uh, you'll understand why this is significant. You know, the sun is big, right? That's an understatement. Uh, you can put 108 Earths across the equator of the sun. It's really massive. And the Earth is really small. And as we are sitting in our chairs or I'm standing in this hotel conference room, uh, the mass of my body is attracted to the mass of the Earth, and we call that gravity. Well, the sun, with so much more mass, exerts a lot bigger pull on the Earth than the Earth exerts on the sun. But the Earth does pull on the sun a little bit. And if you do the math, you can find that there's a place between the two bodies where the pull of the sun is roughly equaled by the pull of the Earth. And it turns out that's at a place called L1, named after a, uh, a mathematician uh, who spoke French, who lived in Northern Italy. I've been to his house, it's amazing. But anyway, that's, that's a different story. So the solar sail is going to go sunward of that, and it's going to thrust constantly to remain between the Earth and the sun to, to enable scientists uh, in the future to use that vantage point to constantly study the sun closer than the earth can get and always between us and the sun. And that's important for many reasons. I'll explain some of which in just a few minutes. Solar Cruiser demonstrates solar sail propulsion, uh, which enables novel orbits and destinations. Um, you can see our mission is about a 10 month mission to do the demonstration. Uh, we will uh, we will have everything wrapped up and show the capability of a sail at that time. The solar cruiser sail is about a third the size of the football fields I was showing you earlier. So it's got a force acting on it much less than the same force would exert from a quarter on your hand. But over our 10 month mission, it's enough to get us where we're going to go to places that conventional rockets can't go. And I like to give this example. If, uh, if there were a race in space between a solar sailcraft and a conventional rocket, and you had a, a spacecraft the size, I don't know, let, let's say a microwave oven, and you put all of the sail you can put in there, which would be on the order of 500 square meters or something, and you compete against a spacecraft that has a conventional rocket engine, you put as much fuel in there as you can put in there, and you say, go, the rocket will fire, burn all of its fuel in about 90 seconds and take off and be out of sight. And you'll look at the solar sail and you'll say, is that even moving? Because the acceleration is very slow. You would go home, go to bed, come back the next day and the sail will have moved a little bit, not much. The next day it will have moved more and then more and then faster and faster. And after a period of time, it'll pass up the rocket, which can't keep accelerating after it runs out of fuel. It's the tortoise and the hare. Uh, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the, the tortoise is gonna win because we have a better capability for small spacecraft than a lot of rockets. Now, why are we going sunward uh, uh, to study the sun and always remain on the sun earth line? Because there are these nasty things caused by space weather. You may have had presentations on space weather in the past, but the sun kicks out a lot of radiation and occasionally there are solar storms where it burps out a lot more radiation uh, than normal, which can affect the power grid. It's been known to, known to cause power outages at high latitudes, particularly in Canada and in the northern U.S., and it can also knock out satellites. And so space environmental monitoring is important because when a storm is on the way, a spacecraft sunward of L1 can detect that, give warning, 
and people can uh, save their satellites or protect the power grid. It's a big deal. Uh, it also lets spacecraft go to locations that they can't go with conventional rockets because they would run out of gas. Uh, think about your trip. The next time you want to take a trip or you've taken trips in your lifetime, uh, imagine what freedom you would have to go where you want to go if you didn't have to worry about putting fuel in your tank and you just get in the car and go and never have to stop for gasoline. That's what a solar sail does for small spacecraft. As long as the sun is shining, you keep going. Uh, you can put spacecraft in novel orbits around the sun and do interesting science uh, that is going to help us better understand uh, the, the ball of light at the center of our solar system that gives us life. And, and in particular, uh, there's one mission that the scientists want to do that a solar sail enables and is one of the few ways you can do it. And uh, let me just bear with me for just a minute while I explain. When you go out and look at the sun, remember I mentioned it's really, really big. 108 Earths across the equator. That means there's 108 Earths of distance from the South Pole to the North Pole. And we orbit the equator, which means we can't see what's going on at the poles of the sun. It's out of sight. We can't see it. There's only been one mission that has flown over the sun's poles and taken data, and it only did it for several weeks. That was it. Now, if we're going to understand how the sun operates and the fundamental science of the sun, you have to know what's going on at the poles. I'll give you a, an analogy. Can you imagine weather forecasting on the Earth if we never knew what happened at the North and South Pole? They would not be very accurate weather forecasts. So it's really important to go study that. Uh, I'm getting close to the end where I'll be able to take some questions. And since I'm talking without any visual feedback, because I can't see you, <laughs> uh, I hope you still hear me. Um, solar sails have had an interesting path over the last 20 years. Um, I actually drew a variation of this chart uh, 20 years ago when I started working on solar sails about how we wanted to advance the capability. And what we wanted to do is every mission be 10 times larger than the previous mission. And I'm pleased to report that we're on track. Uh, we flew the, uh, I'm going to switch to metric units now instead of English units, so forgive me. Uh, in my day job, we use uh, the metric units, but uh, the principle is the same. Uh, 10 square meters was the nanosail D. The near-Earth asteroid scout, which is going to fly, is 86 square meters, which is roughly 100. And in fact, if we had uh, put 100 square meters as our plan, we probably could have packed it in and made it work. The solar cruiser will be 1,600 square meters, which is the 1,000 square meter scale. And we're designed to be able to deploy sails of almost 10,000 square meters, which will enable missions like this polar imaging mission that I mentioned. In the future, if that trend continues, we should be able to build sails that are as large as 100,000 square meters or a square kilometer. Um, that's huge. And once you have those size sails, you can start thinking about taking trips to other star systems. Now, today, we don't know how to build those last two, the 100,000 and the 1 million square meter sails. But if this trend continues as we're building Solar Cruiser, the young engineers and scientists on my team will figure out how to build that next larger one. And then it'll be up to them to go fly it. And I will be cheering them on. Uh, from my retirement as I'm watching that next generation take the torch and carry it into the future. 